So I want to talk to you about this project that I've been working on uh, for the past two years. And um, it ultimately took the form of a text adventure game. Uh, before I start, who knows what a text adventure game is? OK, great. I don't have to explain that. So I thought I'd be really meta and give my presentation in the form of a text adventure game. So I'm just, let's just start off right here. Um, so it's, OK, there you go. Um, I'm, I'm part of a, a, an arts collective called Redoc. We're based in Manchester and Liverpool. And it, about two years ago, we were asked uh, by uh, this organization called FACT in Liverpool to pitch for the first digital commission, uh, the first commission for uh, a project called Network Narratives. And it was about um, young people in libraries in Wigan Berlin Hall. And it was, uh, and we decided, okay, we're gonna get paid to pitch for it, so let's do it. Um, and this is actually online, so you can go through the games if you want. You can just do that if you don't want to. Anyway, so. Um, all right, so. So this was the aim of the, the whole project. It's how do you get young people to work with art and technology in three towns that are very deprived. And um, we've done a lot of stuff in libraries before. There's, there's some past projects that we've done that you can look at. Uh, but we always want to push ourselves, so. All right, so what can we do? This is, by the way, this is how we first start brainstorming for any project. Can we do a swan wave? No? OK, what else can we do? So, <laughs> all right. Um, so I, I, I want to kind of <laughs> do this interactive thing with you. So there's three choices. You're, you are in charge. Where, where should we go? So these are the three ideas. Well, OK, this is not really an idea. But these are the two choices we had. B, OK. But actually, we don't want to do this, because there's already code clubs. There's lots of uh, makers um, who do stuff like this. And um, lots of libraries have computers and people who don't know how to use them. Uh, and you don't really need to do that. And I thought that there were also um, a lot of existing groups who were doing this. Um, and I was really getting sick of trying to get everyone to program as well. So that's a bad idea. So we're going to go back to this one. And that's what, so, so the main idea that I thought it was, we really wanted to use the idea that we're in a library. And even we've been involved in library projects for a really long time. And they were all about digital making. It was learn Photoshop learn um, Arduino or uh, stop motion, make a movie. And you kind of forgot, like, the reason libraries exist is so you can read books, and borrow books, and, uh, and have time to contemplate being solitary and this kind of stuff. So I thought, OK, let's, let's, let's make a book. Um, let's write a story between these three uh, towns and the young people who live there. and. Um, that sounded like really hard to do. And also, what if it was a shit book that they made? That's like ultimately, I want this to be a good project. So I thought, OK, let's try to get rid of, let's try to make it as easy as possible and get them to write a text adventure game. Um, and I was, so yeah, OK, let's do that. They can do something that they've never heard of or, or know about. OK, so. Um, so part of my inspiration uh, for this was the idea of connecting the three towns together. Um, and this was, I, mean, I really like the, the tile map of the Northern Network in Victoria Station in Manchester. I thought, OK, this is going to be my st starting off point to get the kids to think about 
how the North is connected. Um, to, okay, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not from here. So the, the North, it has its own identity. And I, w I really wanted to know what the kids who live there, who've, who've grown up there all their lives, thought about it. And, and really, it was for them to tell me what the North is about. Um, mind you, this was happening in the kind of midst of the austerity cut. And a lot of the libraries were, uh, they had their budgets cut. And part of the reason that this project was funded was because we were working in these three towns that were very deprived. Um, and you, know, you need to bring culture to these areas, according to the Arts Council. So um, on top of making this one game, uh, I also wanted to make uh, tangible things. Now, if you've played these games before, you know about the feelies, right? So, they really bring the fictional world to life. So I also wanted them to think about that when they were making the game. So OK, that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, I'll also let you say, OK. So that's the idea. Let's pitch it. Should we do A or B? OK. <laughs> All right. So. Yay, we got it. It was one of the most terrifying pitches I've ever done because it was to the actual young people. And um, even though I do a lot of stuff with young people, that I still find them like a bit of an alien species. So you, you'll notice that um, I've always bolded the young people, and they're always capitalized as well because they are a bit um, of their own kind of thing. Um, so all right, so th this is how we were going to do it. We're going to have a summit to decide the genre that everyone is going to work in, because it had to be one story, and they all had to make it uh, at least coherent, if not a good, good story. So um, all right, OK. And then we decided, OK, how are we going to get them to write this story? And the way to do that was to break down the steps of creating a narrative. So we were going to do um, a mapping project so that the kids can see uh, where they live in a different way. Uh, the writing and then, OK, so, uh, okay. so that's right. So now we had to go to the first summit, um, which was in Hull. And um, these. Uh, what did I do? Okay, yeah. So, so I, I now one of the hardest things about this project was that even though I, it, 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 I had a year to do it, logistically it was a nightmare because it's the North is not very well connected. Do you know? Um, <laughs> and Hull is like really far away from everywhere else. That um, the 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 consensus had to be done online mostly. So we, I did a lot of Google Forms. And so I sent out a survey in advance and um, kind of predictably, these are because most of them are teenagers, uh, the young people, they wanted to do um, a dystopian future, a uh, sci-fi. That's the genre they're really into at the moment. Um, so there's our, yeah, yeah, we do that. So, and then I did a questionnaire after they've chosen the, the genre uh, to kind of get it down to some base grounds. Because you can't have aliens and zombies uh, at the same time. Well, you could, but it would just be a crap story. And again, that was my main it concern with the overall project, that it was going to be a really bad story. So um, you, you can actually go in and look at the questionnaire so it has stuff like, how far in the future do you want it to be? What kind of things that you do you want to do? Yeah? Oh, yeah, sure. Um. So it's kind of like this. And, I, and, and these scenarios that I, I made up based on what the kids were saying that they were interested in. Um, and, and also what sort of technology they wanted to 
think about sort of cultural, social aspects. Um, so that's how we came up with these ground rules. So they wanted to be set 50 in the future. I, I thought it was interesting that they wanted, they wanted to explore a world that they would still be alive in. Um, and also, I was a little bit surprised that none of them thought about climate change. Um, so, so those are the ground rules that everyone agreed to. And then from, from, from that on, you could do whatever you want as long as you follow these. Um, OK, so then we went to, now it's on to the first workshop. Now, I wanted um, everyone to, so, so part of the project, you also had to teach them some skills and workshops and stuff like this. Um, and I wanted to bring in as many people as possible to do the, the best people that I knew to do the specific strands of the workshops. So um, for the very first one, uh, I wanted to do a kind of mapping exercise. And I let somebody else do it. Um, so let's just see how the one in. Where do you want to go? Should we go see the first? Burnley. So the, the DIY mapping workshop was um, a GoPro on a giant helium balloon. And um, this allowed the kids to kind of lead where, where was mapped uh, for them to get an idea that where they live could be interesting uh, and to show us where they'd like to go and what sort of areas that they hang out in. And also to think about, because they already knew they were going to create a world that was 50 years in the future. What would this place look like 50 years from now? Um, and uh, yeah, and also, it was, it was, as the first workshop, it was fun. It was like an active thing. You did, it's not something you think you could do in a library. Uh, and I forgot to mention, uh, like when we did the summit, every time we introduced ourselves, I sort of had this thing where you, you I gave you name tags, but you didn't write your name, you wrote a fictional character. So you had an alter ego for that day. It was kind of to get them to the mindset of thinking about um, a fictional world. Um, so you can see, I don't, I mean, I changed all the time. I think I was Henry Higgins in this one. Um, and it depended on like what, what was going on. And I believe I was Phineas Fogg when I was doing this one. Um, and then I'll just show you. So this is so that that's an image from the, the camera on the top. So it, it was really nice for the kids to kind of uh, start thinking about an alternative version of, of reality. And then um, just one of the, we went to Hall. It all went well until Hall. Um, when it you can, this is the this is the balloon. <laughs> We're still waiting. Um, I I was hoping like. I did ask Hull Radio if they could put out an announcement to see if anyone found the balloon. But it might be between the, the seas uh, here and the Netherlands. Um, anyway, so, let's, so they've done this bit. And they were all, these, all of these workshops were about a month apart. Because they had to be repeated three times. Um, and, and the map making. So this is starting to like crystallize what you've done. Uh, OK, where, we sh where should we go? OK, I heard Wigan first. We're going to Wigan. So we take, uh, so, so Neil went, did this bit. So he took some of the footage, and we started creating an alternative map, giant uh, sh and, and points of interest based on where they've been and what kind of new landmarks they would like. And this is the point when they started thinking of, as a group, OK, I, I think this place should be like this, or I want, I'm interested in uh, looking at kind of the stuff like that. So this is where Burnley decided that they were going to be overrun by robots. And um, that humans, I mean, the story kind of evolved after a while, but they, they were really interested in this idea that Robots had taken over Burnley, and there was an underground human resistance trying to overthrow the robot overlords. Um, that's it. So you can see sort of the process of what's going on. 
Wait, this is... Oh, right, right, Burnley. Sorry, that the other one was Wigan. Um, right, let's see where to go. Oh, oh, just by the way, before... Okay, let's, uh, sorry. And this is Hull. Um, just the thing about Wigan. So even though we laid the ground rules and I said, everyone has to stick to this, okay? And I had a wiki that everyone could look at and said, you have to follow these rules. Um, we didn't want to follow the rules. <laughs> so they decided to drop a nuclear bomb in the city because they really wanted to do a Mad Max type world where there were lots of weapons. Um, but, you know, the young people are leading it, so we kind of incorporated to it. So, uh, but I was actually, and while I was doing this, the, most, the thing that, that surprised me most was even though we started off on the same ground rules, the three cities, and they're all in the north, and they're all deprived. Um, Hull wasn't as deprived as Burnley or Wigan. And I think this is because uh, before we started this project, I think a year or two years before, they were nominated as the cap, uh, cap city of culture. So there was a lot more investment going on. And, as the, uh, and Hull had like kind of the younger groups, like lower end. So I think like 13 was the youngest group. So I think um, they've not seen, they've just seen a lot of investment in their city. So I think like, yeah, it's pretty well, it's going pretty well. So why wouldn't it continue that way 50 years in the future? So nothing cataclysmic has happened in Hull and actually it's really thriving. Uh, and, and their dystopia was mainly around the evil corporations who are doing experiments on humans and the, and the school system where everyone had to go. Is I have to say, uh, most of the, the stories were kind of cribbed from the Hunger Games, Game of Thrones, and the Hunger Games. <laughs> um, especially in Hull. Um, but, but, but maybe not as violent. Okay, so we did that. And then the next month, we did the writing bit. And this was kind of exciting, because this is where you actually started seeing bits of the story crystallizing, some characters coming up, some plots being made. And all the kids had to work together to do it. And it was like a lot of negotiation. So honestly, a lot for a lot of the workshop leaders, um, it was a case of just being kind of a shepherd or a guide and making sure their voices were heard and they actually did stuff, um, like write stuff down. So what happens to Wigan? You, you can see from uh, some of the writings when it, so <laughs> the Wigan lot were a little bit problematic uh, because of the library, like because of a lot of circumstances. Um, the library partners weren't able to support us as much as they thought they would be when this bid was originally written. And it ha a lot of it has to do with the cut. Um, so we just couldn't get enough kids to come to the library. When we're trying to recruit kids to take part of this, there weren't any in the Wigan library. So we had to go to the youth zone. And that's very different. There was just a different type of kids who go to the youth zone than the kids who would sign up to work on a project that's initiated from a library. So the, the ones who come from the libraries, like uh, Burnley and Hall, they were all really bookish. They liked actually reading. Um, and some of them liked writing. They wanted to, th they thought of writing as maybe a career option. Whereas the, the Wigan kids um, weren't like that. So it was that's, I think that's why they wanted to bomb the city. Uh, uh, it, was, it was really interesting to get lots of insights into how the kids are thinking about where they live by giving them the space safe of fiction to explore their um, current circumstances. Um, so we did that, and then, uh, oh yeah. And, and, and the other thing that we did was we tried to kind of create a system that, or like strand their bits of stories together into a coherent thing so that it would make sense. So like, I know I keep going back to Wigan, but one of the things, they, they're just like, like nothing's available anymore. There's been fallout and all this. So how are you going to communicate? What, what do the people who are left, how do they do stuff? And we kind of like gave them hints and or like kind of tried to help them along. So the solution for how people communicate in Wigan, because uh, there's a lot of technology dead zones, was um, the tried and t 
testing method of teletext. And you'll see some of that later. Um, okay. So after that, so you got the story. Now it's on to the actual building bit. And uh, they, there was one tool that we were looking at from the beginning, which was Twine. This is how I made this presentation in. And it's, it's, um, it's a really powerful tool for uh, interactive fiction. If you're thinking not in the classic Zork type of games, you can't actually type in words. It's more hypertext. It's kind of like um, surfing Wikipedia, and, and but, but as a story. Uh, but it's really good for um, mapping out stories and, and making a, a good way uh, for the kid, for the kids especially. So. Um, so this one was run um, by Glenn and, and Ross, who was going to help with all the, the feelies, or what I, or I termed artifakes. Um, so let's go, let's go, let's go hold this time. So now the, th the thing with, I don't know if you work with young people, but one of the things is, um, th th aside from being um, delightful uh, is that they're really unpredictable. You can't count on them to do anything. Um, and, and that's fine. So you work within those confines. But one of the things is they don't do any homework. You can't design. And, and obviously, this is not, they're not going to be graded on this. So they're not going to do it if they don't want to. So even though we said, what kind of objects do you want to make? <laughs> this is your world already created. Um, they, they actually had some ideas, but not really. Uh, so, so I have lots of because I was working with so many artists. Uh, I had an artist who was who's taking who saw everything, and decided to come up with some prototypes to show that maybe the kids could go use a starting jumping off point. Um, and one of them, I think, was a uh, this is an emoji glove. This is how people will communicate in the future. Uh, it's it's just a glove with Velcro on it. And you get like a pocket full of emoji parts, and then you can create the. And this is, but there's a there's a whole reason for this. It's because you can't. You want to the human resistance needs to find a way to communicate without the robots knowing what they're talking about. So this is one form of thing. And I find, uh, yeah, the, and also the kids already communicate through emoji, so it seemed like natural that they would use this as a, as an evolution of of language. Uh, is this, what is this? That's whole, okay. Yes. Oh, oh, and also, we also w played some text adventure games, and this is when I realized a lot, the penny dropped for a lot of them, because I don't think uh, they knew what we were doing <laughs> until this point when they played Merlin's Castle. Um, also, for the partners and the companions, a lot of them, when I said text adventure games, a lot of them thought it had to do with mobile phones. So, so that's all the workshops finished. So what do we do now? We have another summit where um, all the kids can meet again. Because when you were doing all the workshops in isolation, uh, naturally the kids were only thinking about what's happening in their city, what's, what kind of social changes there are, what kind of food they have, what they eat for dinner. They weren't really thinking about how the, th the stories can connect. So we really needed to have an opportunity for them to see each other uh, and also see it, it, how to link the projects, but also to meet the other uh, young people. Um, they've only seen each other through, through the wiki. Um, and also tie up all the loose ends to the stories. And, and this was really, really difficult because some of the kids were more inclined to making stuff. Others were, were like really liked writing, and they just wouldn't stop. Uh, but also um, to have links and crossovers, and I really want them to think about what what it's like, as like how the North can have an identity, uh, and how, why one person from Hull might visit Wigan. Or like why why someone from Burnley would try to seek communication with somewhere with Wigan or or Hull, uh, and I think it worked. It went it went well. I mean, no one died. That's good. 
Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so this is like six or seven months from the project starting. Uh, and then Glenn finished writing the master um, twine file. Uh, Ross made all the uh, artifacts. And a nice uh, thing for this project that I thought, um, besides having the game online for so anyone can play this, uh, there was also a touring exhibition of the artifacts uh, that would go through all the libraries. And it's currently showing now. Um, and like nobody knew what to call this game either. We were just calling it Text Adventure Time, which is the, what I was calling the project. Uh, partly so the kids would like it. Um, I don't know if you watch Adventure Time. Um, so, but we came up with a name in the end, and it's called Northern Power House. Last Town Standing, um, and there's a, there's a map of the game. There's a lot of them did have maps. I, I have loads of brochures, so you can pick them up later. So um, you can see there's a timeline of critical events that explains what happened up to the year 2065. Um, I'm just going to tell you, just a highlight is uh, in 2025, um, the singularity happens, and Iris, which is kind of like Siri, uh, but backwards, becomes sentient and takes over all forms of electronic communication. Um, and then 10 years later, there's a nuclear explosion in Wigan. Um, in 2042, a laser fence is erected around Burnley, and it's re-Christian Robo Burnley. And there are vats where he, he, humans are grown. You can either be from alpha, beta, or omega vat, and you have to wear a badge to say which vat you were grown in. Um, in Hull, Hull is pretty nice. There's a, a big company called FutureGen that uh, run, run the town, basically. They, 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 um, they, are in charge of the AI industry and the biotech industry. Uh, they also have an uh, evil headquarters under the Humber. Um, and all the kids go to, if you're lucky or privileged, you have to go to the education center where you learn not to ask about the book. Um, and, and actually, this is a school badge. This is one of their school badges. The, their logo is a hybrid of a goat and a spider. If you know your uh, bio uh, engineering uh, legends. This was one of the first spliced animals. They put uh, spider proteins with goats. No. Anyway, that's their school mascot. Um, so, yeah, so it all, it all came together and then we had the launch in Burnley. Oh my god, this, this project took so long. <laughs> I th so obviously, yeah, I, I was very happy <laughs> to do this. Um, yes, and yeah, so after, after Burnley, it went to Hull, uh, and another library in Hull, it was in Leeds uh, two months ago, it's uh, in Accrington now, it's going to Eccleston and St. Helens next, and then thing, beginning next year, it'll come back to Liverpool where it'll, it'll be finished. Um, so you can go see it, uh, please do. Um, but so that, that's, that's how I made the Northern Powerhouse uh, a reality um, ahead of George Osborne, I think. Okay, so there's, so you might be asking or not, but you have two choices. So what, what have I done after this project and why I did text adventure games? So I'm just going to say A or B. So, yeah. So doing this, um, what have I done? Yeah. So I've done interactive fiction. Obviously, the next step is interactive nonfiction, um, and I, I really like the idea of exploring. Uh, so when we do this project, it re I, I did get what I wanted from the project. Uh, that I don't know if it's not a shit story. 
But I don't know if, okay, no, let me rephrase. I don't know if it's a good story, but I know it's not a shit story. So I'm happy with that one. Um, and um, I, I really liked uh, working with, uh, with some of the artists, Ross and Glenn in particular. So we really liked <laughs> the idea of, of using interactive fiction to explore other, th I other ideas and concepts, kind of similar to the way I was able to find out what the kids thought about where they live and where they'd like to be uh, by using design fiction in a way. So yes, uh, we did, we've created some, a little uh, band called Domestic Science that we're going to use. And we've done a project in, uh, in a National Trust property, uh, Ray Castle up in the Lake District uh, to explore radio communication and freshwater biology uh, through text adventure games. So y you can see that there. Um, and I ran a workshop um, for librarians uh, in an arts and libraries conference. And I was really surprised that um, there weren't more arts collectives or, or people running workshops in libraries that had to do with writing or books or reading. Like um, everyone's, re I know, every, like I love makers. I'm a maker myself. But I don't think everyone has to be a maker. And you can't force kids to all be makers the same way you shouldn't force all kids to be programmers. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and again, I used this format to talk to the librarians there. Uh, I did a murder mystery, and, and I'm here now. Um, OK. So do you, do you want to know why I'm doing this? <laughs> OK. OK. So like I said, like not, not everyone has to be a programmer. And, and I, I just, because I've been, I have been dealing with, lo with a lot of young people. And I just see a lot of pressure uh, from school, from parents or peers that you need to learn how to code. You need to learn how to program in order to be a valuable member of society or at least make some money. And I just don't think that's true. And um, there's such a skills barrier. There's such a barrier to entry if you're running these kind of workshops only uh, in libraries or schools or whatever. And, and reading and writing is such a basic skill. Like, you don't really need that much um, to be able to start making a text adventure game. Uh, and it's, it's really, so I it, was really uh, it was really great for me to see the kids just start thinking about things. Uh, and just go it, going at it, which like coding, uh, even with Scratch, I know Scratch is really easy, but there's still a barrier. And this just like eliminates a lot of that. Um, it's still digital as well. Um, I think there's other skills that were imparted to the young people while we were doing this um, that aren't necessarily digital skills or technical skills, uh, like uh, negotiating, brainstorming, uh, like coming up with ideas it, as a group, which doesn't, I don't think that happens a lot. Especially if you know that you have to work towards one goal of creating a coherent narrative. Um, what else? Oh yeah, and I also like Twine a lot. So um, it's, it's, what I'd say. Yeah, and, and if you haven't found, uh, if you've never come across this, I really, um, encourage you to look into it. And there's loads and loads of stories. And um, I think the other thing about interactive fiction or text adventure games is that because of this, because of Twine and such a low barrier of entry, there's a lot of non-traditional people making games, um, like uh, exploring things that are not about killing zombies. So uh, there's this really lovely one called Depression Quest which is also built on Twine, that looks into um, what it's like to have to live with depression in a way that you would get from so much more than just reading something about it. So you, you start to really empathize it. And narrative is so powerful in doing that. So um, yeah, please take one of these if you want. And um, I can, I'll give you the URL so you can play this game and explore all the other dead ends. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like. Later. Okay. Thanks.